Hello, everybody, and welcome to Knife Delights. Welcome to another Saturday chat. This is such a fun series for me to do. I get to talk to a lot of great uh, people behind the knife channels out there. And today is no exception. I have a wonderful guest, uh, Ken from Last Chance Knives. Uh, he did a Two for Tuesday video here just a few weeks back. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that just a little bit and, and the importance of uh, participating in the open tags. But because he did participate in that, his video showed up into my feed. And I watched it. And maybe we're going to discuss that video just a little bit. But I was sure glad, glad to come across his channel. It's an exciting channel. Ken has some wonderful insight into cutlery and how to repair them, how to maintain them. And so I think you're really going to enjoy this little chat here this morning. Ken, welcome to Knife Delights. Thank you. Um, so you, your channel, I know you've had your channel for a while, but uh, what kind of got you interested in having a, a knife channel on YouTube? I know I played around with it maybe seven, eight years ago just for a little bit, but I was never really serious about it and it, it never went anywhere and I kind of lost interest in doing it. But, you know, recently I've gotten back into traditional knives um, pretty seriously and I wanted to start a start up the channel again and try and get it going and, and see where it went. And I also wanted to put out some useful information and some things that I've learned during my life and hopefully some of the information will be useful to people. Um, some hopefully some of the information will be useful to people. Sure, I know I've been uh, trying to learn how to like uh, repin an old slip joint knife and how to clean them properly, and I experiment with this and and that, and it's just a lot of fun because I know my viewers leave me a lot of tips. You know, hey, try this, try that. Uh, to me, it's a lot of fun learning together. So to have another channel out there and uh, you know a man with your knowledge certainly helps the community here yeah well things i've learned i i usually learn by trial and error with a heavy emphasis on error you know it's experimenting <laughs> and that's right you, know, you see where it goes it's even even in making knives um i i used to have a pretty extensive fixed blade collection i love fixed blades mm -hmm. but i would like the blade on one knife maybe the handle on another knife but there just seemed to be nobody that really put it together and made a knife that I actually liked. Um, one of the things in knife safety that I always um, am very concerned about is the handles. Sure. If you have a comfortable handle, your hand doesn't get fatigued, you don't get tired, and you're much less likely to slip and make a mistake and, and hurt yourself. So I like a, a handle, a specific handle. I make ones that fit my hand, and you know most other people seem to really liked them a lot too so i take the blade designs that i like and put them on the handle designs that i like and put it together and that's why i started making knives in the first place so how long have you been making knives uh, probably eight or nine years wow and it's Was... it's just a hobby i don't i don't make that many you know if i make one knife every two or three months that, that would be a lot mm -hmm. well that's certainly a lot more than i've ever made <laughs> So what is what was the biggest challenge uh, for you to overcome uh, with learning how to make a knife? I know you've got to temper the steel just right. You've got to uh, prepare the handle materials just right. But what do you think was your biggest challenge? Uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is doing the grind. Okay. And as far as the heat treat, you can do a lot of research on it. And when I started, I, I bought a kiln so I could do very precise heat treats on steels. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it. Uh, you you could make a brake drum forge for pretty much for free just from scrounged parts. But mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to work with a little bit better steels that have more alloying elements in them. And I wanted, you know, exact repeatable results. So that's why I went the route with the Kelm, which they're not cheap. They're they're like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars when right. I got one years ago. Now mm -hmm. I think they're over two grand. Yep. But I it's was, the uh... grinding, it's the grinding that was challenging. That's so that what, there's, there's a pretty good learning curve in getting it accurate. So it's everything is just done by eye. There's no machinery like in a knife factory. They would have a machine for most places, and unless you get into customs, you know that does the grinds. So it would be easier to get them even. They're spit out and they're automated. But you want to get a grind on both sides of a blade that's even. That can be pretty difficult just doing it by hand. Mm -hmm. 
So when you first started out on your first knife, how many tries did you did you have to like do it and then say, nope, this ain't going to work and start over again? Um, I don't have too many that were wasted. I, I had a couple of okay. blades in the beginning because I wanted to perfect the heat treat and I used those to learn on. So I, I would make a knife, you know, and heat treat it and then you have to temper it to pull the hardness back. Otherwise, it'll be way too brittle. So I'd sure. pull the hardness back a little bit, test it and beat on it, get the knife to chip, then pull the hardness back a little bit, test it again. And when I got it to stop chipping, then that's the point where I say, this is the heat treat that I want to use. And then if you yep. go any softer than that, the edge will roll. So there's kind of a sweet spot in the middle where the edge doesn't chip and where it doesn't roll. So yeah, I, I use some of those test knives to find, to find that spot to perfect the heat treat. Okay. Is there a particular steel that you like working with? Um, I like O1 and A2. Those are my two favorite steels to work with. Uh, and there's another one that I've been over the, in the last year that I've been playing with. That's ADCRV2. And that's that's a really nice steel. That has, I'm going to say, a little bit better edge retention than 1095. But its toughness is about comparable to 3V. Hmm. It's a lot tougher than 1095 or 01. So it's, it's a really good steel, especially for a, a fixed blade that might see some rough use. Right. Now, I'm just going from what I've heard from others and read. Um, sometimes it seems like it's not so much when, when you buy a knife from a you know commercially produced knife. It's not so much the blade steel, but how well they tempered the steel and treated the steel. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's a lot of variation. Now, I, I have a couple of blades here that I'm. Oh, here. This I'm is... going to pull you up. Let me pull you up on full screen okay. so we can see it good here. Okay, okay, this is one that's still in the process of being made. I didn't make a handle for it yet, but this is an ADCRV2. It's just okay. a small belt knife, and I would put this in the class as a get off me knife. Yeah, every every edge will be sharpened. So I'll show this again when it's finished. It'll it'll oh, look quite a bit great. different than this. But as you can see with the with the grinds and how you get the different you know the facets as you come out to the tip to get everything even is it takes a little bit of work doing that by eye. Sure. Now I was a uh formerly a peace officer so i carried the k-bar tdi and so i know exactly what you mean by a get off me knife yeah so that that's interesting but this one i also tried to make as something that's that's useful for everyday carry it you is. Do have a thumb ramp you have you have a you know a very convenient way to hold it where it's not dangerous to yourself even though it'll be sharpened on all edges mm-hmm so this is something that also would be useful because if you're going to carry the knife, let's face it, you're probably never going to need it for, for its intended purpose. It's going to be used to open right. boxes and cut cardboard. And, you know, so if you're going to carry something, you may as well have it usable for everyday tasks. Yep. You bet. Yeah. So do you normally just do smaller knives or do you vary between like longer and smaller or? Well, the largest one I've done is about 12 inches. Okay. At about a 12 inch blade my kiln is 18 inches so that's the limit on what i can do and okay. i i prefer mostly knives let me see if i have one around here here's one i'll show on a on a fixed blade friday I, I actually recorded the video i might show it on this friday so this is a you know four and a half inch blade this is about the size knife that i i like most often because i get the most use out of them you can carry sure. them so so that looks to be somewhat of a spare point uh, yeah yeah okay so do it's you have a, a continuous curve on the does. blade yeah so when you're when you're cutting with a continuous curve it's always doing a shearing action it, it cuts differently than a straight blade right it's, yeah. it's a little bit more aggressive and the, this handle on this is a desert ironwood burl i don't know how oh, good the camera beautiful. is going to pick this yeah. up but it's coming yeah, it through is really a, well yeah it is a very nice piece of wood it's a special piece of wood and i saved it for a, for a project that it was worthy of that that's a gorgeous knife now when it comes i've been thinking about buying some knife blanks and just practicing making some handles in that my my question for you is like if i um you know, we have walnut trees and oak trees here. If I was to go out and pick up a fresh piece of a branch of walnut or oak, what do I have to do to that wood? Do I have to like 
somehow kiln dry it or, you know, dry it out in the oven some? Or what do you do to yeah, it's, help preserve I, the wood? Mm-hmm. I'll buy wood that's already dried and okay. is ready for use. You know, I'll get, you can go online and buy it in small, you know, small pieces that are sized for knife handles. Mm-hmm. But if you're going, going to do it yourself, you're going to want to let that wood stabilize probably for a couple of years. Okay. Because if you you epoxy and pin it onto the blank, but if that wood isn't, isn't um, if, if it shrinks because it has a higher moisture content, mm-hmm. it's going to pop the epoxy and your handle is going to pop. Now, okay. walnut, I know is a problem. I've done, I've done two knives in walnut handles and both of those handles have popped off the metal after a couple of years. Hmm. Because it just so takes were, so long for it to dry out. It, they were on those um, test knives, so it never was it never was an issue. Um, they never mm-hmm. went to anybody else, and I mean, it's that the pins still hold the handles on. It's not like they're useless, but I should rip the wood off and and redo it. Okay. So sure. that's just one one concern, and I also find oh, if you did that, adding a liner helps too. You can get fiberboard spacers, and that'll help just provide oh. another medium in between it there can be i can find you know it could be maybe just a little bit of slippage it's just a just like a little buffer that helps with the expansion and contraction sure and that would work well up here you know where we can go from you know 9500 degrees yeah. and 80 percent humidity down to 40 below i mean you back can, and forth so you can even see on this one you see a little thin strip of black i do between yep. the blade and the wood that's one of the fiberboard spacers. It's a black spacer in there. I think I actually have some of the material here. Okay. Because um, I'm gonna, going to be doing a, a knife with red, white, and blue spacers. Oh, nice. For a patriotic theme. Sure. So these are, these are the spacers. They're probably only a 32nd of an inch. And that's huh. the fiberboard. Yeah. So that's good material to put in between. And you can purchase that at like knife supply store. I know there's uh, yeah. websites out there that that sell knife making supplies. Is that kind of where you would get things like that? Yeah, those spacers are from a company called Jantz. Okay. Okay. So I'll just Jay. remind I'll just remind everybody here if you have a question on um, making a knife or that, leave a comment below, and I'm sure Ken would be more than happy to try to help you out or answer your question or. If it, if it's uh, maybe significant enough, maybe he'll do a video on it. So I, I encourage everybody to uh, please like this video and leave a comment there. Um, Ken, I thought I was prepared here, but for some reason, I don't know where I put it. But you sent me a special gift here the other day. And that gift was some beeswax with, with uh, coconut oil in it. Mm-hmm. And I did a, a video where I uh, kind of refurbished or uh, uh, preserved, reconditioned, I guess is the best word, reconditioned a couple old leather handles on some old fixed blade knives. And I have to say, I think it worked very well. Um, can you share a little bit of information on uh, your new concoction, your new product there? Well, probably ever since I was in my early 20s, I, I come from a farming background and i always had work boots the leather would dry out and start cracking and i found a product called snow seal right which it's a beeswax based product but it does have some petroleum based solvents and stuff in it and that worked great that would help waterproof the boots and preserve the leather because when the leather gets wet and then dries and gets goes through that cycle it cracks over time and right. that's usually right. how the boots fail i would have the leather fail before the soles would ever fail uh-huh so I had been using that for years. Um, I've been using, I also make concealed carry holsters, which would be a hybrid holsters oh. out of kydex and leather. Sure. And and I soaked them with a lot of snow seal to waterproof them, especially if you carry in the summertime and it gets hot and humid, you know, and you mm-hmm. sweat a lot, you want to protect the leather. Right. But I was looking for something better that didn't have these chemicals in them. Mm-hmm. So and I couldn't find anything that I really liked. And they don't, they either don't list the ingredients on the product or you have to do searching on the web to find what's really in it. They may list just the, the main active ingredients, but they don't list all the solvents and all the other garbage that they put in it. Yeah. So I wanted to come up with something that was more of a universal product. You can, you can use it on leather, like I said, on your carbon steel, 
-hmm. And especially if you use carbon steel knives and then, then you go use them in the kitchen or you put some on to keep them from rusting on a camping trip and you use them to cut food. I don't want things with chemicals on it. Right. I want right. everything that I put in it. I want to be food safe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, that's what all... led me to come up with this. And you could just do some research on the internet and you'll find there's, there's tons of stuff, tons of information on natural products like this using, you know, beeswax and coconut oil. And I do want to make one more addition to it. I want to put in a little bit of olive oil. Because olive uh, oil it... is also good for softening skin and leather is just skin. It, it helps soften yeah. the leather too. Yeah. yeah. I, I was, uh, Glad to hear you uh, saying you wanted to try some olive oil because I know some of my viewers in the past, um, like for outdoor leather stuff like uh, tool pouches and that, they always said that they would use olive oil and rub into it and that helped preserve it very well. So yeah. um, I guess when I first was doing research on how to, you know, best to preserve leather and this and that, it seemed like every product out there had a downside to it. So it was like, well, it's great for this, this, and this, but watch out for this, you know. <laughs> so you're just like, yeah. you're left scratching your head of what am I supposed to use? And I think what you've come up with, it certainly will never do any harm to the leather, but I also believe it, it's going to protect it and keep it revived. Um, and so I want to thank you so much for sending me that gift. I will be using it a lot. And it's nice because, as you said, just the heat from your hand, that's all you need. Just rub that uh, little cube a little bit and then rub it on the leather or on the blade and it's safe for your hands. So it's just a wonderful product. So thanks again. Yeah. I'll also rub it on, um, rub it on my lips in the winter time after I use that would it because your lips yeah. get dry. So it's, you can use it for a lot of things. And there's also some other tricks you can do to help it absorb into the leather better. Just right. throw it on the dashboard of your car for 20 minutes mm -hmm. you know, and that'll, that'll heat up the leather and then yep. it'll soak in a lot better. And you can also use a heat gun or a hair dryer, but you have to be careful. Leather is skin. So if it's too hot for you or, or going to burn you, think about it. It's probably going to do the same thing to the leather. It's not going to be good for right. it. So you right. want to use a gentle heat. So I'll, I'll use you know a heat gun or a hair dryer at a little bit of distance. Sure. And you know you can warm your leather up and, and then it'll soak in better when you apply it. And then there's also another another trick that I've done with it. If you apply it onto the leather fairly heavy and then get the heat gun, and and hit it you have to watch how you do it because you don't want to get it too hot it's mm -hmm. almost like it it kind of i don't know it does something to the wax and it it gets a dark color so okay. you can you can affect the the coloring of the leather by how mm -hmm. you apply heat to it yeah and it, that's more how it how the beeswax and the, and the coconut oil are reacting and so you're not you, you don't want to heat it to where you burn the leather obviously but right yeah, any kind of warming you can use. I was thinking of uh, a heat lamp where I could reg kind of regulate the heat, raising yep. and lowering the heat lamp. It doesn't take a lot of heat, but just getting it warm, you know, it's just like trying to dissolve salt or sugar in water. If the water's warm, it dissolves better. And it's a, kind of the same principle with this. Yeah. It's going to apply more evenly and probably soak in a little better. So, no, I thought that was very interesting that you came up with that. Um, I also know in watching some of your videos, you've had like some case knives and like the centering was off on them and you kind of demonstrated on how you got that blade centered back in there. I thought that was pretty ingenious. Uh, <laughs> can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, that was a, that was an experiment. I'm not sure if I would recommend exactly what I did to them. But that, experimental was a or of them. not, it, it, yeah. it worked and it's just yeah. interesting for me watching your thought process and how you explained it so yeah yeah i considered that you know one of the things before i do stuff like that i consider the knife almost as trash before that that it's so mm -hmm. far off it's rubbing the liner and i don't know i just don't want to carry a knife like that there is a there is a certain pride in in carrying a knife that's functioning properly Right. And if somebody else wants to see it, and there's, if there's somebody else that was interested in traditional knife and they pick it up and they see the blades are rubbing and everything, it's all scratched, you know, that just is, doesn't make a good impression on getting somebody else into traditional knives. So right. I, the knives that I carry, I like to be right. At least in a case, I don't expect them to be perfect, but I don't want them to be rubbing the liners. Yeah. You know, on a knife like a Stockman, you are going to have some blade rub because you're you're cramming three blades into mm -hmm. you know, two spaces. So there is yeah. going to be some interference. Yeah. 
So I just figured, why not? I'll do what I can. I I had heard that, and if you, I had heard that maybe towards the base, the knives were a little bit softer. And if you think about it, they have to heat them up and then quench them in oil. Mm-hmm. So when they're quenched in oil, I, I would say by the, by the end of the blade, they're probably held by a rod through the hole that's drilled in it. And when they're dipped in oil, well, if, they're, if that part isn't submerged, that part's going to be a little bit softer. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a case. This is just something I heard online. So I figure I'll give it a try. Yep. And it did take more force than I, than I really felt comfortable with to straighten mm-hmm. that blade out. So yeah. that may not be the case. Um, now, on well, the other hand, I have this queen knife here. Okay, now, let this, me bring you this up knife, again here. You may even be able to see it in the camera here. Let me see if I can get this where. Yeah, maybe you can't pick it up in the camera. The blade's not straight with the knife. It oh, is, yeah, it is I, crooked. I see that. I see it. Yep. Okay. I see that. Yep. It was more crooked than that. It was it was rubbing the liner on this side pretty hard to where it was even hard to close the knife. You'd have to push the blade in a little bit to close it. I just I opened this up. I just took it in my hands like this and gave a little bend. And that night that I actually bent it too far. I had to bend it backwards a little bit after I was done. Hmm. So to me on this queen, it, I mean, it's a pretty knife, but the heat treat is really questionable. You should not be able to bend the blade in your fingers. Sure. Yeah. You know, sure. It tells me that steel has to be really soft. Yeah. I won't know until I sharpen it and I, I try it and see what the edge retention is, but I don't expect much out of that. And right. it's a cheap knife and it's the origin is China. So what do you expect? It's going to really be hit and miss. Yeah, it is. Um, so, yeah, I kind of follow your philosophy. The, the liner locks that I have taken apart, I mean, a lot of them are like two or three dollar knives I found in an antique store. And it's like, I can't hurt this knife because it's not a usable knife or it's not a good knife in the condition it's in. If I totally ruin things, you know, break something on it, lose pieces from it, whatever, I'm not out of anything. And I got a few hours entertainment playing with it, right? <laughs> Pretty cheap yeah. entertainment mm-hmm. is the way I look at it. Yeah, before you start doing something like this, you already have to consider the knife is is kind of almost yeah. as I can't hurt it. Like you said, it's it's trash. I'm not going to carry it. So there's no loss in experimenting with it and trying to make yeah. something usable out of it. I've I've tried repinning two or three knives with limited success. That's just something I'm going to have to keep practicing on. There there's definitely an art. You know, you talk about sweet spots about. Mm-hmm having it tight enough you don't have any blade wobble but not too tight to where you can't get it to close so there is that sweet spot in there now on a a couple of them that i've peened back over and tightened and then sanded the bolsters down what i found is it's even a little bit more than that you initially have to put it slightly too tight because it has Mm -hmm. to break back in and then so you need to get you need to get it to the right tightness so it breaks back back in Mm -hmm. and it functions properly and isn't loose again yeah and that's why i've always said you know with a slip joint when when i get a blade that uh is maybe a little tough sometimes you know even after you've lubed it and cleaned the pivots if it's a uh, you know got a little bit of resistance there that's fine because with use it's going to break in which means it's going to last i would rather have that than something that's too soft to begin with because you know it's not going to last very long before you get to develop some blade wobble and and things like that. So, yeah. If one is just right from the factory, you carry it five, six, seven years, and it's going to have a little bit of play in it. It is. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're a tool. They wear out. It's yeah. like anything else. Uh, uh, it just it's it's nice to know that they're going to last several years though. Now you talk about you know you grew up in a farming background. I was not raised on a farm. I am in a small farming community, but of course my father and grandfather and generations back were all farmers. And, you know, I just remember my dad and grandpa, all they ever carried was a slip joint knife. You know, they, I don't know how they made it through life without all, you know, S35, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and flippers and, mm-hmm. and my car to scales. I don't know how they made it, but you know, they use those knives for cutting twine, opening feed bags whatever and somehow they survived well even today i still prefer a lot of the simple steels like i i love o1 tool steel and Mm -hmm. one of the reasons i like it is it holds an edge a reasonable amount of time 
it's not going to hold an edge like your modern super steels do but it also sharpens up i can just take a half a dozen licks on the ceramic rod and things ready to go again so mm -hmm. there's that maintenance side of it too what what do you have to do to maintain that knife and i find your your carbon steels and some of your simple steels the maintenance part of it is just so easy that overall you spend what far less time sharpening it for a certain amount of cutting right right you know, the some of those super wear resistant steels if you get those things dull um i just for example i have a, a lion steel here mm -hmm. let me see where i put it this is a lion steel best man and i reprofiled this because i like a, a much lower edge angle you can see the bevel is quite wide mm -hmm. and this is an m390 and this this blade took me about 45 minutes to reprofile on a I think it's a 220 grit DMT diamond stone. So in O one knife, I, I'd almost remove the whole blade doing that for that amount of time. Sure. So there's that aspect of it. And how easy is the thing to maintain? If you have to work on it, how much time does it take you to work on it? And that mm -hmm. the simple, the simple steels just are so much better as far as that goes. I've always been uh, in the camp of, with like a survival knife, I would rather have a softer steel, uh, you know, like a 420HC. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it it would dull on you quicker, but out if you were in a true survival situation, you can sharpen it on a rock. You, you can find something yeah. to sharpen it on. And, you know, with the upgraded steels, yes, it'll stay sharper longer. But what are you going to do if, if it does get dull? How are you going to get that yeah. thing sharp again? Yeah, like I, I run my 01 a little bit hard. I run it around 61. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of companies run it at 58, 59. And mm -hmm. to me, that's just too soft. 01 is its best when it's it's got to be, got to be at least 60 in mm -hmm. order to be at its best. That, that's where you get your increased edge retention over steels like 1095. And 01 can be run harder like that without sacrificing toughness. Yeah, so right. you still get a hard blade. You get good edge retention, but, but you do retain that ability. You could find a smooth river stone and you could sharpen it. Mm -hmm. Now, that M390, if you tried to sharpen that on that smooth river stone, you'd probably wear the river stone away. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that, that was my point, I guess, is you're better, to me, you're better off, you know, having a softer steel out there that you can sharpen on, you know, a river stone or just whatever you can find out there to sharpen with, you know, keep it sharp. And also with the softer steels, you know, as you're using it, if you just, sharpen it as you go just with a few strokes it's easy to maintain that edge and just keep it the way it is i know uh growing up as a kid uh the old man that lived <laughs> close by uh ran a quite extensive trap line every winter and i was fortunate enough to go out and help him run his trap line and, and help him skin you know afterwards and i for the life of me i'm trying to remember what kind of well, you know, what knife pattern he had, and I cannot remember, but I always remembered when we got done uh, skinning uh, for the day, he'd sit down at his bench and get his little whetstone out and just, you know, give it a few passes back and forth, not hard, you know, not heavy sharpening, and he was able to maintain it. And so I'm sure it was just some simple 440 steel back then in those old pocket knives. Which so, actually worked pretty good. It did. It so, did. And that, that knife was always sharp. Yeah. You know, years ago, we didn't know any better. We didn't, this other stuff didn't, that we have today, it didn't exist yet. And well, yeah. we didn't know we were missing anything. And actually, I, I, th I think in some ways it's a, it's a few steps backwards. You have the cost because the cost of some of this stuff is huge. Yes. And then you have the maintenance. Like I yep. said, I, my, my preferred sharpening method or maintenance is ceramic. Mm -hmm. And what I like about ceramic is that you maintain a toothy edge. If you go too far on the strop, I mean, you could do a little bit of stropping to get rid of a burr, you know, to help clean, just clean up the edge. But if you do too much stropping and you polish the thing, you have a different type of edge, which I don't like. So I like to maintain the toothiness and the bite on the edge. And I find ceramic does that. And I can just do a couple licks on ceramic. And there's, there's, two, there's two specific ones that I like a lot. I like the Spyderco bench stones or for portable use, they have a one that's called double stuff, which is the same gray and white ceramic as their bench stones. Uh -huh. And then 
Lansky makes a, it's like a 10 or $12 ceramic rod. It looks like a butcher's steel. It's got a wood handle on it. Mm -hmm. And that works great too. Yeah. But those are, that's how I like to maintain and, and keep them honed. And it, it usually doesn't take more than, like I said, you know, half a dozen to a dozen licks on that. And depending on how much you've used it and it's right back ready to go again. Well, and personally, you know, I'm bad about this, but if we would kind of all get in the habit of, like you said, with a ceramic rod, when you're done using your knife, give it a couple passes on your rod and keep it sharp. I just, I just, uh, you watch the old movies and you see the barber and before he goes to use a straight edge, got that strop there, you know, just uh, gives it a few swipes to keep it sharp. If we would all <laughs> remember to do that, then we don't have to worry about sharpening so much because we're keeping it honed up as we go. Mm -hmm. But I get lazy. I got to admit it. <laughs> we all do sometimes. And that's why I, I like the carbon steels because it makes it easy. You know, yep, it makes it easy to do that maintenance. You don't have to say, I, now I got to sit down for 20 minutes and work on this edge. Now I pick it up in, you know, 30 seconds, I'm done. Yep. Uh, and I've told this story before, but I asked my father if he had any of his old pocket knives, you know, once I became a collector and, and, started really getting into the knives here five, six years ago. And he said, no, he said, they were cheap. We used them up and threw them away. <laughs> so I, I just remember, and this is a sacrilege, but I know he sharpened his knives on the bench grinder. I mean, it would be dull. He'd go over to the bench grinder, zzz, zzz, you know, a little bit and, and go back to cutting. And yeah. like the philosophy, and they were, they were cheap, you know, and uh, they didn't worry about fit and finish. They didn't. They had something to cut, and they wanted to cut. And that's all they cared about. Yep. So, well, if it's a tool and you're going to use it hard, and you may even do some prying and stuff with it, then that's the right right way to go. Yeah. Don't bring something expensive out that you're afraid to use. Exactly. Yeah. If he broke it, if he was, uh, uh, you know, cutting heater hose, or he was scraping a gasket off of something, or whatever, and he broke it, no big deal. As you said, they were cheap. Okay. Can you excuse me for just one second? I have somebody knocking on my door. I'll just. That's not a problem. Okay. Um, can I come see you in a little while? Because I'm on a I'm on a conference call. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Nope. No problem. That happens. So, um, before I forget, okay, what you were saying, you were saying oh, about bench grinder. So I'll use oh, yeah. a, an angle grinder for things like machetes mm -hmm. or. Or even, for example, something like an axe. I keep a rough use axe if I have to get a tree stump out or something like that. I don't care if I hit rocks and, you know, stones and yeah. I don't care what I hit. And I just, I keep that tuned up with an angle grinder. Sure. So there are, depending on the use of the tool, and that's only a $15, you know, Harbor Freight axe or something like that. You know, it's, it's yeah. a cheap, it's a cheap axe for rough mm -hmm. use. I have fine axes for if I'm going to split firewood or if I was going to take on a camping trip, I have, you know, better stuff and I, I won't treat it like that. Right. So you have the right tool for the right job and for the abuse stuff, you know, sharpen it the quick way. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> it just so happens that I want a Leatherman signal from CB tactical. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had it for five or six months now, I believe. And uh, he was on RJ's live the other day or left a comment on RJ's live the other day. And I, it, it jarred my memory. I'm like, you know, CB, I need to, <laughs> I need to get this reviewed for you. So the other day I kind of did a, just a tabletop review. And then I wanted to uh, do a part two to that video and actually go out and use it. Now, the reason I bring this signal up is because I ran across a very interesting video of yours from several years ago, where you actually replaced the blade on your signalman. And let me just pull this up here real quick. Well, there's the blade. It's 420HC, but it's got serrations on it. And you are in the camp that you do not like serrations, especially on like a Leatherman. Is that a correct statement? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, one the one time I don't mind serrations is say you have a multi-tool with two blades on it and the second blade is a serrated blade. In that sure. case, give me a full serrated blade and, and I'll be happy with that. But as a secondary blade, not as a primary. 
right uh, for most right. things i just don't like the way they cut um try making some feather sticks with those serrations you know if, yeah, if you're going to start a fire they give on the leatherman they give you a a small fire steel on it so try yep. making feathers and stuff with the, with the serrations it doesn't work you have to use the tip of the blade where it's where you have a small straight section mm -hmm. but then you have leverage working against you it's easier to use it in close to the handle when you're doing stuff it's Absolutely. it's less fatiguing less torque on your wrist and you just have more control over it yeah so um i'll probably put a link to that video uh in the description box to this one and i'll <laughs> I'll just invite everybody to go check that video out. That was interesting. Uh, like you said, uh, I, if I remember in the video, you know, you're talking about trial and error, how you got the blade shaped and then it didn't, wouldn't quite fit and you had to take it back out and, and do some more profiling on the blade shape and that. So very interesting. I, I have a great admiration for craftsmen and people that are able to visualize something and then, and then make it and do it. And have the perseverance to stay on it. So uh, a tip of the hat there to you, Kim. Thanks. I've probably made about a dozen of those blades now, and those things are a pain to make. There's so many things that you have to get right on the on the fit. So many, you know. Yeah. I would I would imagine making a blade for a folding knife is more difficult than like a fixed blade knife, which you know you're worried about the pivot and and uh, even as far as making sure that the hole you drill in the end is in the precise middle of the blade, you know, there's got, there's got to be a lot to it. Well, I look at it. I know I'm going to make some errors. So if you know, you're going to make errors because we're humans, we're not machines. We can't do mm -hmm. everything perfectly. Make the errors on the side that you can correct. So yep. make the error on purpose in a way that you can deal with it. Absolutely. So I'll drill the hole first, then I'll start, shaping the rest of the blade so, so that i can get the lock right and then how it works on the ball detent and the stop excuse when me it opens for just one moment mm -hmm. excuse me Ken. sorry i had a little background noise here i had to deal with too so yeah and those those signal blades, they take about three hours with hand files, just fine tuning and getting it perfect because you can't do all that stuff on the machine. At least I can't. Well, that's why I said perseverance, because you <laughs> you, you get really got to concentrate on your task. And so. Yeah. Um, what just overall, what do you think of the signal in general, this model of Leatherman? Yeah. I mean, I do like the tool. I mean, it's a it is a little bit gimmicky. But overall, it is a good, solid tool. They have good tool choices in it. And it's pretty strong and pretty robust. It does, I think it does make a good multi-tool if you're going to take it outdoors. Yeah. That, and that's what it's designed for, more for the outdoorsman than, than for the tradesman. Yeah. You, know, you talk about gimmicky, the, there's a whistle down in here uh, with the ferro rod holder. And <laughs> that whistle doesn't work. I couldn't get it to work very good on mine anyway. Mm -hmm. I have to practice with it, I guess. Now, there are some parts. If you look on Shapeways, you can get some different parts to replace those plastic inserts. So okay. You can get bit holders, and there's, you know, if you want to carry more bits. So you, you can get some other different things for it. Yeah, and the one thing I did like is, uh, like, the, the wire cutters in there, they said they're replaceable. I thought that mm -hmm. was a pretty good feature to them. Yeah, previous to that, I was always very careful with how I used a Leatherman cutting wire. But mm -hmm. now I really don't care because if I mess them up, I'll just put a new pair of cutters in there or take yep. them out and, and sharpen them a little and put them back in and get a little bit more use out of them. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, Ken, is there anything else that uh, we haven't covered here this morning that you would like to talk about? Well, one of the things that um, traditional knives let me do is I've, I've always just loved leather products. Mm -hmm. I've always been a big fan of leather. So I started getting into making some more things in leather. In the past, I mean, I would do enough that I would make, you know, conceal carry holsters or I would make a leather sheath for a, a fixed blade knife that I made. But with, with these traditionals, I've been making different pocket organizers and different slips just for my own use. I'm not, I'm not interested in, in selling any leather products, but just as some examples, this is this one that, where this lion steel was in. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the first leather slip that I ever made, so this is number number one. <laughs> okay, now I got you up on okay. solo now, so go ahead. 
Okay. Yep. And this is a little pocket organizer that I made to go with it. So oh, that's a nice. knife, yep. knife and a flashlight, and then mm -hmm. it has an additional pocket on the back, an old a pen and either some paper or some cards or something like that. So that is very nice. I've also made some different stuff for what I'm carrying today. And I'd be interesting to see what you're doing for the 30 day challenge. This is one oh. of the knives. This is one of the yeah. knives I've carried. And this, this actually, this sheath was a mess up. I had, I had put a little foot on it so that it doesn't tip over in your pocket, but it looked like, ended up looking like a Christmas stocking. So I cut it off. That's why you see the stitching on the one side is kind of messed up. Right. But, but I'm carrying one of these old timers in there. And I really like this knife. I actually like this better than the sod buster. It's the same size, but these give you a little bit more of a point rather than just being round and being blunt in the front. So mm -hmm. I do really like this. And I saw some of the things that Richter was doing. So I gave it a, I gave it a try just for. Oh yeah. Let me see if I can get this in here. I mean, yeah. I would never sell something like this or, or I'm not going to copy somebody else's product. I just made this for myself. Right. right. And I wanted to see if I could do it. And I made a, another one, which is a little, this little different. I have, still have to put some dye on this and, and finish it. But this is a larger one for a larger knife. This one will actually swallow up a, a full-size sod buster. Because this right. is something that I don't see. You know, from any of these, any of these guys that are making leather. There's a lot of these slips are for small knives, but I haven't seen any for a large knife. So what I tried to do on this one is a is a pattern that is going to resemble checkering on the gun stock. Oh yeah, this is what I what I went for with this. But I've got to do something to highlight some of the lines, and so you can see it a little bit better as checkering. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I'll show you what I've been carrying for my 30 day challenge, and I will say. In a way, it's not a lot of challenge for me because my one, my number one knife that I always carry is my uh, Victorinox Evo Grip 11. I always have, this is the first knife that goes in my pocket every day. So I always have this one. And then it's just a matter of what am I going to choose as a secondary knife. So since we're talking leather and slips, I've got this little slip here that was made by J.O. Ventures Outdoors. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a gift to me, and he also sent me this uh, little old-timer Mighty Might. So this last week, uh, that's what I've been carrying, the little Mighty Might. And, of course, this one is a liner lock. Um, the week or week and a half prior to that, um, I was wearing, uh, carrying my buck canoe. And I have actually carried this knife a lot as as a everyday carry I, I love the canoe pattern these blades are just awesome and they you know this knife's just never let me down it's always been up to the task so i like the canoe pattern and then i first started out for the first week or week and a half i have this old k-bar stockman and of course a a, a medium medium sized stockman is a very good carry it's big enough, you know, the blades are usually big enough to, to get things done that you need done. You got three blade choices. But then with a medium stockman, it doesn't weigh down your pocket very, very much. Doesn't take up a lot of real estate. So, yeah, that's just an old K bar from with uh, Jig Delrin. So that's what that I've been there, carrying. You see, I think it's one area where the slips help. It, it does make the knives a lot more comfortable to carry. You don't have just a doesn't feel like you're carrying just something in your pocket that twists sideways or sticks you in the wrong way. It just, mm -hmm. it makes all the surfaces smooth and it, it stays upright in your pocket pretty good. Yep. And I find it just, it makes a heavier knife more comfortable to carry. Now what I've been carrying, and this is, this is one of my favorites is a large stockman. Oh, sure. Yeah. I liked it. This one is, um, this one is labeled. I think it, when I got it, it was labeled as, chrome vanadium but the stamp on the blade is cs so i don't i don't know what some of these case ones mean i know it's it's definitely carbon steel yes yeah. you can see a lot of color on the blade but you know, they kind of keep things a mystery you don't know exactly what it is but what i like about these large stockmans is you have a a knife that makes a good handle you know it's 
you can get a good grip on it. And if you're doing, mm -hmm. doing a lot of cutting, you don't get tired or your hand doesn't get fatigued. Plus you have a large blade. So you have a large knife and then the other blades are small. So you still have two small blades for doing precise work where you don't have, have to have that long blade out there. So these Absolutely. have just been ideal. This, this has been my favorite knife to carry. So I use, I've been carrying that, um, on one of those case makes a cheap, um, uh, belt sheath. It's kind mm -hmm. of a scout carry. And the large one is only yeah. 10 bucks and it actually carries these things. Great. Then I've been putting this old timer in this slip in my right front pocket. And then the other thing I've been carrying, which I always carry this, I always, I always have a Leatherman on me. Oh, okay. And sure. just because of the work I do, I have to have a multi-tool. It's, yeah. I use it constantly throughout the day. And See, I, like don't, every, I don't necessarily carry one every day. As a matter of fact, I, I, I guess it, I hardly ever carry one. I always have one handy in my vehicles or I, I have several of them. It kind of strategically placed in case I need one. I don't have the use for one, you know, every day, so I don't actually carry it. But I always have one handy, and uh, they're they're definitely very useful to have around. Yeah, I do um IT. I'm the IT guy for a small college, so I'm constantly sure. working with wire and stuff. And I also do all their their sound and lighting. So the multi tool is just something that oh. I can't get by without having. I'd have to constantly be running, making trips back to a toolbox. Yep. So yep. just having that with me lets me fix something on the spot when I find it. Sure. No, I, I can totally understand why you'd you'd uh, carry one like that. Now, you, you bring up Stockman's. So just for the viewers, if, if you want to um, excuse the children from the room, because it, it might get to, uh, well... This show might, this little chat might take a turn for the worse because the reason or the way I discovered Ken was he participated in a two for Tuesday open tag and he was going over a couple of the buck stockments, which was fine. But he was, uh, well, then he brought out a case knife and he described on why he preferred to carry his case stockman over the buck. Now, for most of you, you know, I am a I'm, what do you want to call it? A buck fanboy? Is that what you want to call it? And so, you know, my first human reaction is, well, hey, wait a minute. You're talking about my buck knives here. But it made me sit up and notice. And I, and I want to thank you so much for the way you presented that. And you gave your logic. You gave your reasoning. And nobody can argue with something like that the way you presented that. And I, I just... Again, a lot of respect for you on how you did that presentation. And it gives gave me a reminder, and I'll remind everybody that, uh, you know, sometimes we settle on a particular knife brand or any other product, a, a particular brand, and we like it, so everyone else must like it. And you can't talk about my brand because I like it, so you have to like it. And so... It really made me sit up and take notice and reevaluate what I'm doing with my buck knives. It makes me look at them in a different uh, venue or a different frame of mind and also my case knives that I do have. And so I want to thank you for that video. It was it was uh, done very well. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about why you prefer your case knives over your buck knives? I would like to say I do like buck knives. Buck does make a lot of good stuff. I don't know who makes those stockmans for a buck. They, the ones I did the review on were the ones that are USA made. Mm -hmm. But it depends on who makes them. And the, the quality can vary you know, between the individual maker or the individual plant that they're made in. Mm -hmm. So like any other of these knife companies, they have some stuff that are hits and some stuff that are misses. Mm -hmm. um, case, I've, just, I've liked their heat treat. I like that I can get them in the carbon steel. Most of the other ones are stainless. You know, mm -hmm. Unless you go higher end and you spend more money. So for a reasonable price, you get a decent knife. And if you buy them in a store, you can check your blade centering and make sure they don't rub. Now, there's some things you can't find in this store. Like I've, I've got a couple of the ones from uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works that are in 1095 steel. You can't find any of that kind of stuff locally. So you just have to get it and take a chance and see what you have. And if it's bad, send it back. Yeah. So yeah. I just... 
I like the flexibility of a stockman. You have, I think of the sheep's foot blade as what would you use a utility knife for? Right. And that's any, anything you would use a utility knife for. The spade right. blade, if you carry a sod buster, you, you have a very similar type belly to it. So anything that you would do with the belly, you have that spade blade for. And then you have yep. the clip point blade, which I tend to keep clean because I like mm -hmm. to use that for food or, or if I need something that's pointy, if I need to pierce something to get to start something, you know, op opening something up. Right. Right. So I like just like the flexibility of the knife. Yep. And, the, and like I said, the steel choice, you know, I prefer the carbon steels in these knives. Sure. Yeah. Just in general, a stockman pattern is just a, a great knife. And there's a lot of them out there that make them. Um, I've found some really nice ones like this one, found a real nice one for, you know, very inexpensive in an antique store. Now, some of them you look at and the blade's half gone and, and this and that. But every now and then, you know, you can pick up one that looks hardly like it's ever even been used and, and get it for five bucks or ten bucks or something like that. So, yeah, it, it's just a good pattern knife. So, well, Ken, yeah. I've certainly enjoyed having you here on the show here this morning. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out, out of your busy schedule to chat with us here. Uh, do you kind of have any closing thoughts here for our uh, viewers this morning? Um, I don't know. I would just say try some, of these, try some of these traditional knives. Even if you've been stuck on modern knives and on folders, you have so many knives now. They're $250, $300. They've gone crazy. I know Benchmade mm -hmm. has gone crazy. I mean, I love Benchmade as a, I love the products that they produce, but I haven't bought any Benchmade knives in several years because they're, they've just gone crazy with the prices. Mm -hmm. um, Spydercos I like, they seem like they've, they've tried to keep them down a little bit, but I know everything is going crazy with inflation now. So, but with the traditionals, you get a good value for your money. You get a good knife, you still get good steels. They may not be the modern high-end steels, but they'll be easier to take care of. And you'll be able to use them more. And that's that's really what it comes down to. The knife is a tool. It should be used. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have a knife that if you have a $300 knife and you have a job that needs to be done. I know I've done this in the past. You pull your knife out and say, yeah, I really don't want to use it for this. And then you put it back away and you find another way of doing it. You, mm -hmm. you carry the tool. It should be the use. And you should carry something that you're not afraid to use. And that's one of the things that these traditional knives give. You can You can have a knife that's still good, isn't that expensive. And you're not afraid to use it. Yep. Very well said. Very well said. So everyone, um, I'm going to put a link, uh, I think, to his Signalman uh, video where he made the knife blade there. I'll put that in the description box. I highly encourage each and every one of you to go out and check out Last Chance Knives. Um, he's been putting out a lot of great content recently. And when one of his new videos come out, I can't wait to punch on it and watch it. I know you'll enjoy it. Watch his videos. Hit that like button on his videos. And make sure and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll get notified of any of his new content coming out. So once again, Ken, it's been a great pleasure. And for everyone, go out and have a very delightful day.